Hello and welcome to the Cube Pod. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante, weekly podcast, episode 49. Dave, last week we were in Barcelona for uh, the pod because we had to record it there because we were flying back and we didn't want to miss a week. Here we're a little bit short on the time. Um, we got a lot of stuff going on. So we're going to get about a 20 minute podcast in here. Um, apologize for the audience. We only got a short version, but let's just jump right in. So a couple of big things post MWC fallout. A lot of virality around the Broadcom interview with Charlie Kowaz and and the, and the CTO at Dell Technologies. Very interesting dynamic there. And two, um, CrowdStrike had earnings out of the park. Will Palo Alto get the get the billion dollar, hundred billion dollar market cap first? You got Broadcom earnings and MongoDB coming out. We got SuperCloud next week, and of course Elon Musk is suing OpenAI. Um, and so again, crazy week. Let's just jump right in. Um, on the on the earnings, CrowdStrike, okay, and and security market. We got RSA coming up. Of course, we'll be there with the cube. What's your take on the earnings from CrowdStrike? So I tweeted this um, with my COVID brain. You know, as you know, when I landed, I had got COVID, but so hopefully we didn't I didn't affect anybody at MWC. But um, they blew away their quarter. I mean, they you know Q4 ARR was three point four four billion. So that's net you know ARR date. 34% growth. The big number to me in the, the print was they did 282 million in, in new net new ARR in the quarter. And people were the high end of the range was 260. So they kind of blew that away. Their free cash flow margin was 33%. You know, roll of, rule of 40. You obviously know what rule of 40 is. For those who don't know, if you take free cash flow margin plus your growth rate, you want to have a 40 percent add those you want to be at 40 percent they're at rule of 60 so the analysts are really excited i'm frankly really excited because i've been watching crowdstrike now since 2019 you know ascend and even before that but really could see it in the spending data and i think this company is going to hit i think they're really on track for 5 billion for the fiscal 26 i think they're going to be 10 billion before the end of the decade so this is amazing and what's exciting to me is palo alto networks which you just referenced much closer to 100 billion they're at like 90 billion crowd strikes you know 70 let's call it I gotta look it up but they Palo Alto cited consolidation fatigue and spending fatigue and Palo Alto has a big consolidation plate as you know John security is a very bespoke set of tools customers might have 30 40 sometimes hundreds of tools Palo Alto was benefiting from consolidation they were giving away free trials for six months because people weren't spending and so they're trying to keep them on the hook crowdstrike also is a consolidation play and very clearly they're not having that same problem and the last thing i'll say is a very large portion of the revenue is going to be coming it has come i think 25 percent now but it's going to be close to 50 percent within you know a couple of years outside of the core endpoint into protecting identities and and other and cloud security. So CrowdStrike is a true platform yep. company. You're seeing that happen. They've got real AI. They've been at it for a while. I, I love this company. Who's going to get to the hundred billion dollar market cap first? Them or Palo Alto? Well, you know the old saying I invoke it here often, the first disappointment is rarely the last. I I would say Palo Alto is so much closer. They're probably only eight billion away so if the market takes off palo alto might fly with some people trying to speculate but i would say that crowdstrike has a really good opportunity to surpass the value of palo alto within the next 12 months well we got earnings coming up broadcom earnings mongo earnings coming out um so we'll see what comes out there let me see what the what the what the feedback is here. What do you think is going to go there? I mean, Broadcom obviously uh, had a huge pickup last week from Mobile World Congress. Um, great network effect happening with our interview with Charlie Quaz, who's the president of the Semi Group. Clear that the chips are dominating the conversation at Mobile World Congress and in the industry. We got uh, Nvidia's event coming up next week. Um, you're going to be out for that, and uh, just a lot of action. On chips, Broadcom you should know. do well, and they should be squeezing VMware. So we'll see some action there too. Uh, you know, I want to say something. So I've been, you and I have been talking, debating, tug of warring, whatever, just discussing um, Nvidia. Are they, you know, going to be a, a monopoly? 
or and with with legs or is it going to be competition i put out a twitter poll and you know most of the people but not not a majority not not more than 50 percent say nvidia is going to dominate for a decade you know about a third say competition is going to level the playing field and then some about a quarter say a new leader is going to emerge i think it's much lower probability than that um but nonetheless i have been saying on this cube pod that even if competition, you know, come, comes comes forth, they're not going to have a, a, a monopoly like NVIDIA or like Intel did. But I was talking about GPU competitors and completely blind spot on Broadcom, which has monopoly like margins. And so, and that really ca came, their strategy really came into focus when we sat down with Charlie uh, Kawas for a good 35 minutes mm -hmm. last week. And I, the the big takeaway there is they're not making GPUs, they're making all the connections across the XPUs, the the GPU, the CPU, the neural processing unit, the language processing unit, the accelerators. All those connections have to go communicate with each other, and it's a memory. And Broadcom makes those components. And what you pointed out to me, I didn't realize this. There's only two companies that make both connectivity inside the chip. NVIDIA with InfiniBand, obviously Broadcom going open with Ethernet. We'll talk about that. And silicon for the switching capabilities, yeah. you know, at scale. Only two companies do that, NVIDIA and Broadcom. So it's, again, a duopoly with yeah. monopoly-like margins. Yeah, and what's interesting is I think we're starting to get visibility on what we're calling clustered systems, this new systems revolution that we've been calling. And we're getting a lot of people who are agreeing with that. And so there's kind of some consensus around that. The second thing that's happening is we have our SuperCloud event coming up next week. We've got another one in July. And the, the SuperCloud event next week is going to be about the AI innovators, the uh, people making making it happen in AI, the newsmakers, the entrepreneurs, the big companies. Because they're the ones who are building the next apps. And the big thing that came out of Supercomputing 23 and now Mobile World Congress on the infrastructure side, and certainly reInvent was a validation, is that the infrastructure to run AI is changing. So you're going to have the innovators that we're going to feature next week. And then July, we're going to feature this kind of the super cloud data platform. You, we call it the six data platform. Some people say the next frontier platform. But the modern stack of analytics is changing. And people are talking about that at, at great length. And this is the theme this year, Dave. The data equation is changing radically. The infrastructure to run on it is changing. And the apps will adapt to that because the apps are forcing it. You can't have good AI apps without it. And as a result, you're seeing a lot of excitement, but that's starting to wane right now. The results coming out, Edelman had a survey that showed that public confidence in AI is dropping. And I think that's because most people think of the AI and generative AI as that is open AI and these large LLMs where you type in, you know, give me a, a book report on this or write a paper from you, write a blog post. That's not real AI because it's hallucinations involved. So people are seeing hallucinations and going, I don't trust it. So you have a big inflection point happening right now, specifically around the confidence of AI. And some people is going to fall on the, on the side of no confidence, which could stifle growth pop the bubble, if you will, or it stays on the line and the confidence stays high and entrepreneurs and, and the large innovators or the innovators who are making it happen, change that. So um, it's going to be, my personal bet is the bubble will pop, but the confidence will stay high and the, the development and the developer community is going to drive the change. It's clear to me that the developer community will be the canary in the coal mine. The big guys, the hyperscalers, are going to be the real power there as well because they need to have they have the scale so the combination of developer cloud scale meets ai will be the tell sign so it could go complete bubble pop nuclear winter or pop the other way and stay strong up and to the right so i'm betting it's going to be up and to the right tony bear does disagrees <laughs> Maybe so. What, what's your reaction to that? Because we, you can feel the pressure. It's not accurate. You know, Trust. I, I, I want to. It's it's sort of not related necessarily to AI, but it come came out of that um, 
Edelman study. Did you see? I don't know if you saw this. Journalists were basically, in terms of the, the trust level, were on par with gov government officials. I know, that's them. terrible. Like behind the... CEOs, they trust CEOs more than they do journalists. How bad is that? I mean, it's yeah. like media is just dying. I mean, because yeah. the the bullshit. It's well, amazing. People, well, the well, people, the media companies. First of all, their revenue model is dying. We called that years ago when we started working together with Silicon Angle thirteen years ago. We knew the the, rev, the ad model is going to die. It wasn't sustainable. However, media is still holding on to that. And by the way, the newspaper industry, which is pretty much defunct except for the big ones, used to make money on classified ads. Remember that? And then that went to the internet. So now journalism they held on to that banner advertising model which only rewarded the large volume. Facebook and those guys killed media because they sucked all the eyeballs. So the, the, the media, independent media companies pretty much went away, except for the big ones like the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, because they could pivot to subscription. Whoever didn't pivot to subscription lost out. That's number one. And two, they became uh, political in their coverage. So you know that's the sacred cow of journalism is to be that independent third party, you know, checking power, so to speak, or, you know, working on behalf of the audience, not for some political party. So I think people just got sick and tired of that combination of that. And also with no revenue, you can't invest in talent, right? Well, so, so if you don't have talent, you can't have good stuff. You don't have good content. You don't attract the right audience. And then you get to the, the, the race to the bottom well, and the race but, to the bottom means crappy coverage crappy content like bait. baiting yeah and just and then you start seeing other fake people emerge hand waving you know taking selfies no substance and what's going to happen now is you're going to see people get rewarded for for high quality network effect meaning pass along distribution in the social networks linkedin's growing like a weed you start to see these pockets of communities where you're going to see action and reward is is the content good enough to ha have legs to run in these social networks where there's targeted network effect, meaning pass along the content. If the content's not being passed along, you have nothing. That means the content isn't good. If you have a lot of views or no views and no network effect, that means it's not real. So, you know, I think this is now going to be validated in the mainstream. We've been seeing it for years. Again, I saw it with pod tech and podcasting 20 years ago. You know, when you start to get these network effects, they're highly valuable, but the numbers aren't big. So, well, you know, that's, the, that's what's going to happen. And trust, by the way, will be the, the number one commodity that will be. Well, be, be and, and I worry that the industry analyst, you know, the world that I'm in is, is, is going down, you know, not a great path. You know, with uh, obviously we're big believers in disclosure. We uh, I have no problem with people getting paid to do work and to write. Um, I do have a problem. Somebody says, "Okay, we want you to write something good about us." Okay, and I'll pay you. Well, <laughs> I don't or or, or you, lie or lying. Right? You can't buy you can't buy yeah. an industry a, a true industry analyst. You can't buy their opinion, and they will walk away from business. Um, first of all, certain firms like Gartner. Uh, will not do sponsored content. And I'm not sure if Forrester does. IDC will. But IDC, when I was at IDC, we had very strict rules on disclosure. And and we would put stuff in a piece that says, look, these are the caveats. These are, this is the truth. Here's where the product is weak. Here's where it's strong. You know, vendors would say, well, you got to take that out. You got to tone that down. We'd be like, look, if there's something technically inaccurate, um, tell me. Or if I've got the pricing wrong, tell me. But otherwise, yeah. I'm printing this. You know, that's why you're paying me is because I'm an independent. You're not going to pay me because I'll write something good. So that that level of, 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 of you know, that strict level of disclosure mm -hmm. and frankly ethics is it, it, it's certainly cracks in the armor in our yeah. business. And I get it. You know, people yeah. got to eat. But I just think I, I, want, I want people to really be careful. But I also want to come back yeah. to this whole six data platform thing and just make a quick comment. I know we got not a lot of time. Yeah. Um, but so let's, you got to follow up on that topic and I'm happy to yeah. stay there. Well, that's about, that's, that's what I stayed on. That's what I wanted to bring in. We got a little change on the media, but you're right. Media relations and analyst relations. 
if there's no more analyst firms to relate to, you don't have analyst relations. If there's no media companies to relate to, there's no media relations. These are departments and companies. So I think that's going to be a big topic of my talk with Ray Wang next week on the ethics of analyst relations. So um, check out Ray Wang's tweets and you'll find the address of interesting DM me if you're interested. But David, six data platform is yeah. the key that's going to power the apps that need that are going to take advantage of the new infrastructure. So you have two power dynamics. The pressure to have generative AI applications being written by developers and then the underlying infrastructure to be scalable and support the kind of data you need. And then the data layers to make it all work in real time, which is runtime, real time, runtime, and then um, develop the data, move data around, make choices in real time, low latency data movement. So this is a huge thing. You've been on it. We've been on it from the Cube Research. This is a big part of that. And that's coming down the pike. This will be the determinant of wh whether generative AI has legs in the next year. Yeah. And just, when, when we talk about this new data platform, six data platform, whatever we're going to call it, and we're sort of working on the name, think about IT stacks today. They're very much app centric, right? The app determines the everything else behind it. Um, how much you're going to spend, who's going to pay for it, what the infrastructure looks like is very, very application centric. And we're shifting to a world that's data centric. You know, the, the implication of being app-centric is you're automating processes. There's a process. We're trying to cut the humans out or minimize human labor. So it's it's very much focused on, okay, what can we automate? And I think we're moving from a world of automating processes to one of automating decisions. That's when people talk about co-pilots and systems of agency, that that's what they're talking about is the, the AI is going to be taking action, you know, on behalf of humans. As a result... Data, you can't have AI without good quality data. So you, right now you have data that all these application silos, companies want to put data at the core. And, and that is a big change. Uh, and, and, and it involves having coherent data uh, it, with a lot of different types of information. And we're moving to a world where all the people, the processes, the, the places and the things that are represented uh, in your business are going to be represented in data, digital representation of your business. And they're going to be connected in a coherent way. And that is a big leap from where we are today. It's why, for example, Snowflake is saying, shove everything into Snowflake mm -hmm. and we'll manage it because we have to do that to make it coherent. But the problem is you got to shove everything into Snowflake and Databricks is saying, no, no, don't shove everything into Snowflake. We're going to unify everything with the Unity catalog. And you were, you, you were there last year. So you heard yeah. that very, very strong and compelling story, but there's some holes in that story as well. So I mean, there's gaps. So there's all these gaps that we're trying to fill with where do transactions fit? Uh, how do you yeah. deal with open table formats? How do you make sure that metadata is unified in in in, a, in the same uh, you know store, data store? And, and if not, how do you get to it in a very timely manner with low latency? I mean, very, very complicated computer science mm -hmm. and, and you know, long time data management problems. But people are beginning to solve them, and AI is showing us the way of you know light at the end of that tunnel. Well, we only have, I wish we had more time, but next week on Tuesday the 12th, we'll be live in Palo Alto Studio for SuperCloud 6. We will kind of do an abridged version of a pod addendum. So if you're listening to this podcast, tune in to supercloud.world, thecube.net, check out those sites. On Tuesday the 12th, we'll be live. We'll do a little abridged pod to kick off at 8.30. Um, Dave, real quick to end out here, Amazon is paying uh, close to $700 million for a nuclear data center campus. Um, Nutanix CEO sees opportunity for VMware turmoil. These are all stories on SiliconANGLE. Um, hot right now. Uh, right. CrowdStrike, you talked about that. Um, you're, seeing, you're seeing essentially Salesforce launching new stuff. Okay, we'll see how that that plays out because they have- Data Cloud's hot. Salesforce Data Cloud is hot. Right data now. Cloud's hot. And we have, remember, Snowflake lost- uh, that has a new CEO, right? So we yeah. covered that last week a bit, yeah. but we yeah. didn't cover detail. The stock dropped like a rock. Um, it not, it's 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 been struggling. It was up a little bit today. I saw so, so you know, some people, you know. So you got Snowflake. You got Snowflake Summit coming up as a big event. Databricks is Snowflake. Databricks reporting maybe not not going to go public. Reporting unbelievable revenue. Okay, Ali, the CEO on LinkedIn. Uh, essentially going direct saying, hey, we're, we're kicking ass. We don't need to go public. So it'd be, be interesting to see what happens there. Um, 
cybersecurity, um, just tons of stuff going on. And ch management changes at Cisco. Um, Cube alumni Liz Santoni got promoted to Executive Vice President, General Manager of Applications and Chief Strategy Officer. She's now going to run a big part of that business. Mark Patterson, Chief of Staff, takes over some of her uh, corp dev roles and incubation part of that team, which is a, a whole other group at Cisco. Um, and, and just a lot of action going down. Who runs um, AI at Cisco? <laughs> we that's a good question <laughs> cisco uh um i'm probably running it by committee right now but it's going to be hard because ai is a feature across all the things so jonathan davidson runs networking this ai and networking g2 patel's running collaboration and security tons of ai there listen tony's running apps of visibility and all that stuff that's had tons of ai so you can't have an ai centralized ai division because ai has to stripe across all those different sections of cisco so but right like now Pro, can you have an ai czar should you have an ai czar? i think i think they're struggling with that question right now so you know we're not in the board meeting but i, I guarantee you um that chuck robbins and sitting in this room with his team they're having this conversation it's like the cdo conversation chief data officer do we have a centralized chief data officer that becomes kind of a figurehead or aggregator of knowledge and put standards together throughout the organization or do you have it individually placeholder in the divisions that's a hot topic and worthy for, of a deeper conversation yeah so that, i wish we had more time aws you know you know following suit no you know losing egress fees i also wanted to just mention a couple new hires um uh, bob la liberté a new network analyst comes to us from esg and mike bodette Bodie. many people in our community know mike bodette long time mm -hmm. friend colleague very well respected super yeah. excited to have those guys on you know, having um, a lot of new analysts coming on board too, we have more announcements coming. Um, you know, one of the things that's really exciting, Dave, and, I, and you know, give props to stay in the course on Wikibon, which has been renamed the Cube Research, is the quality of the model that's developing with the Cube Research is impressive because it's not your yesterday's analyst relations, analyst model. It combines the best of analyst quality, serviceability, um, and standards and integrity, but at the speed of the market now with the real time data coming in off the cube and the tooling we built. So, you know, it's almost like the, 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 the magic of Silicon angle media, which is the publishing side, the cube and now cube research together with the back end video, um, AI cloud is really an interesting combination and we're getting insights faster and uniquely and unique insights we've never seen before so what's clear to me is, is that it gives us the ability to synthesize the picture of trends connect the dots faster look at buyer behavior and identify things months in advance of normal more normal tooling and technology um, huge opportunity for uh, customers to help them architect the best solution i mean just understanding clustered systems is going to be important. So as these big tectonic shifts happen, enterprises need the best data and the best service possible more than ever. The 80s, 90s, every major inflection point, the service had to step up. And that's how you you can find the winners and the losers. And the people who step up during the times of crisis and opportunity. And we are in the biggest chaos, uh, chaos system now, but the opportunities are massive. And um, I just want to, it's just awesome to watch the uh, the, the pace of innovation. CubeAI.com now brings in articles from SiliconANGLE. Soon it's going to bring in research from the Cube Research. And it's very interesting, John, to see how that's working. Because um, yeah. you 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 insisted that we architect this to keep the, the data set separately because the linguistics of the spoken word are different than the written word. But from a user experience, we can combine them. So we're playing around with that. It's I was talking to some practitioners recently, and they have they're having similar challenges. They noted similar things. And then they brought into transaction data or structured data and unstructured yeah. data. This is really interesting to see the developments. It's you know it's far from perfect, yeah. but it's really. I fun. mean, our our Cube AI with very little capital is almost as good as perplexity within our world. So we we're linking directly to to the articles, directly to the videos where the where it's actually mentioned not just sourcing a video as an as a file. So uh, we're going to see a lot more AI that looks a lot like a runtime assembly and a compiler theory. So you think about compiler design, compilers and computers, 
those notions of compiling and running things at runtime, that's coming to generative AI in a big time. That's computer science, Dave. That's distributed computing. That's why, you know, my conversation with the Broadcom president, Charlie Kowaz, was, was so good because those guys are working on the systems that are going to power this next level computer science, the next level of system management, the next level of technology that's going to allow open source to soar. And that's where the action will be. And nobody sees it coming. I see it. We see it. And I think that's going to be where the magic is. So again, the Cube Pod will chronicleize all this. The Cube will be out there on the ground going to events and in studio. And we'll, SiliconANGLE will be covering all the articles. And the Cube Research will be rolling it up together and getting the insights out of it. So... <laughs> like and then the uh, last thing I had is next week Oracle, Asana, UiPath, Sentinel One, Adobe, Page, PagerDuty, Foxconn, and SmartSheet are all announcing. So we're gonna have a lot of yeah. talk about next week, John. Yeah, yeah. All right, Dave. Good, good chat with you again on the twelfth Tuesday. We'll do a cube pod addendum. Sorry for the short version. We had so much to go over. Elon Musk, our, our rant, so much more, and Tony Bear's story on SiliconANGLE. He wrote a guest post. It's pretty compelling. Um, really. Uh, really critical analysis in a good way of where the industry is. And we've got to check that out. So of course, go to siliconangle.com for all the articles, cube.net. Uh, see you next time.